enga mana, enga reo, enga rangatira mau. Ki te mana whenua, te ati awa taranaki whanui, tēna koto. Ko tā Edmund Hillary, te tangata, ko Edmund Hillary Fellowship, te whare. Ko Maungatapu, te maunga, e rū nei tāku ngā kou. Ko Mātai, te awa, e maheia nei mā harahara. Nō pakatū ahau. Ko Rosalie Nelson, tōku ingoe. Ko te Chief Executive Edmund Hillary Fellowship, ahau. Nō reira, tēna koto, tēna koto, tēna tato katoa. I would really like to welcome all of you to this really exciting Edmund Hillary uh, Fellowship Springboard Session, where we're looking at Aotearoa New Zealand's priorities and opportunities in this emerging decade of action on climate change. Just before we launch formally, I would just like to open the space and pay respect to, respect to the elements with the karakia. Kia hora te marino, kia papa, papa, O namu, hei huarahi mā tato, aroha atu, aroha mai. Tato ia tato kato. So thank you. Look, today we are really privileged to be joined by local and global leaders who are going to be bringing really fresh insights and calls to action um, in the post climate change conference COP26. Uh, I'd like to begin because I know that while we've got many fellows on the call, we also have a number of leaders in Aotearoa. So for those of you who are perhaps not so familiar with the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, we were formed to pilot uh, an innovative global impact visa program with Immigration New Zealand. Now that was back in 2016. Today, we have 532 world-class innovators, investors, entrepreneurs, technologists, scientists, creatives, educators, and visionaries. And all of them are really are committed to Aotearoa as a part of this program. Our purpose is to partner with Aotearoa New Zealand to find and build solutions to our toughest challenges so that we inspire global leadership and solutions for future generations. Uh, I have to say, when you're starting to talk about climate change, that is absolutely one of our toughest challenges. Um, we are also a part of the Hillary Institute. Now, the Hillary Institute celebrates global leaders who are driving transformational change on critical social and environmental issues. Today, we have 10 laureates that have been celebrated one of whom is our keynote speaker, Johan Rockström, uh, a foremost climate change scientist and also architect of the Planetary Boundaries Framework. So we're really honored to have him here today. And I'd also just like to um, really welcome the founder uh, and director of the Hillary Institute, Mark Prane. The, the genesis of today's session for the Edmund Hillary Fellowship is the recognition that the climate crisis is an absolutely defining moment for every one of us. And what we wanted to do was to bring together, uh, a convene a shared conversation to build a shared understanding of what it means for us uh, as a country and how might we collaborate for collective impact. Our, fa our facilitator today is the fabulous fellow Rod Oram, who is one of New Zealand's foremost business journalists and climate change commentators, who was uh, a part of our founding cohort at the Infantry Fellowship. Um, and Rod is, uh, believe it or not, joining us from managed isolation, having just flown back from COP26. So look, before we kick off and I hand over, there are just a couple of housekeeping issues. We will be recording and live streaming the main part of the session. Uh, so if I could just cue the recording to start. We do ask you to stay on mute when you're not speaking and to try and just limit background noise and interruptions if possible. Um, we are going to have lots of opportunities for interactions um, and for questions. We just would ask that you use the raise hand function on Zoom to moderate questions. Just unmute yourself when prompted to speak. Alternatively, you can, of course, post a question in chat. After the session, we will be publishing a summary and next steps invitation. So please do look out for that. Uh, we also have a shared notes document that the team will share in chat now. Now. Uh, now, this is an open document where we will be harvesting ideas, questions, and we'll note insights for the publishing report. So 
feel free to add your ideas and, and to use that. Uh, so look, now I'd just like to hand over to Rod Oren and thank you, Rod, so much for taking the time to lead this amazing session today. Well, um, Atamarie, a peaceful morning to you all. Um, it's a great pleasure to be um, online and it's also a great pleasure to be home. It's been um, an amazing trip up to Glasgow and back and I come back um, with a greater enthusiasm enthusiasm and determination for the task, um, but of course, even uh, uh, steelier eyed about uh, what needs to be done. Um, in, we'll, during the course of this session, we'll dwell a lot on what was going on at COP and what the opportunities are for us as New Zealand, but it basically comes down to um, two themes about how we respond in urban New Zealand and how we respond in terms of our, our natural uh, ecosystems and, and the rest. So that's how we're developing, we've uh, organized the breakout sessions afterwards. But it's a huge pleasure um, to start with um, having Johan Rockström on online with us from Berlin. Uh, Johan was um, a founding director of the Stockholm Resilience Center, and there did, uh, he and his colleagues did extraordinarily important work on establishing the planetary boundaries that we, um, the, the limits of Earth's living systems that we have to um, make sure we live within. And um, if you haven't yet seen the uh, recent Netflix documentary with Johan and Sir David Attenborough, please do, because that's a, a wonderful expression of that uh, really important important science. These days, Johan is director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate um, Impact Research in Berlin and um, is continuing um, his great leadership globally uh, on climate issues. And, um, and of course, Johan was at COP and um, it's going to be fascinating to hear um, his assessment of what COP achieved and what tasks it's given us. Um, Johan knows us quite a bit because in 2017, he was the Hillary Laureate that year um, in recognition for his global leadership on uh, climate issues. And then he joined us in New Zealand in 2018 at our New Frontiers get together. And um, he was incredibly generous with his time and also very busy speaking to government uh, during his visit. And out of that came the Planetary Boundaries Report for New Zealand, uh, which I believe is the first time that the um, global framework and data has been downsampled um, to deliver a, a, a country report. And it's a fundamentally important one um, because it shows how um, enormously we're breaching many, many critical planetary boundaries. So Johan, thank you very much for joining us uh, rather late in your evening in Berlin. Uh, a great welcome to you. And we're very keen, pleased uh, to hear um, your thoughts. Thank you, over to you. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks, Rob, and thanks, Rosalie, and uh, great to be with you. I, I wish uh, we were physically together. I had such a wonderful time at uh, Aotearoa, and, and just just for the first time, experiencing your beautiful part of planet Earth. It was extraordinary, and 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 the way you took care of uh, of me and all the Edmund Hillary fellows. Um, it just shows what an enormously you know, dynamic and, and innovative program you're running. So, um, you know, congratulations to, to all your great work. What I wanted to do is is, is kind of walk through in, 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 in basically four segments. First, just give you a little bit of a scientific uh, background where we stood when we uh, came, came to Glasgow, basically, on the global climate crisis. And then talk through my perspectives on COP26 and, and, and what happened in Glasgow. And then what does this imply for, for our stewardship of planet Earth and the planetary boundaries? And finally, say something about exponentials and, and uh, the journey in, in the next uh, nine years of, of this decade. So if we start in, in the crisis, I think it's, uh, it's really important just, just to... Um, be, be absolutely kind of calibrated before having any reflections on COP26 that, you know, with, with the sixth assessment of the IPCC and with the tremendous advancements in the biodiversity research of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and all the, the advancements on research on tipping points, there is there's no other conclusion than, than um, what has been drawn up by so many colleagues uh, scientific colleagues around the world, 
that we are not only in a climate crisis, we have a planetary emergency. And, and, and why, why would you, as a scientist that normally is so careful on, on how we weigh confidence levels and probabilities and risks and language, come to that dramatic conclusion? Well, how do we define emergency? Well, an emergency, as, as you all know, is risk multiplied by lack of time. So if, if, you're, you know, if your house is burning, you call that an emergency because it's a catastrophic risk multiplied by it is really, really time limited. You have to hurry and go very quick. Science has been focusing on risk for 30 years. And risk is, as you all know, probability times impact. So even low probability occurrences can have high risk if the impacts are unacceptable. So like, for example, having two meter sea level rise for low lying neighboring countries to New Zealand disappearing is an unacceptable impact. So therefore, even a low probability, even a probability below 1% would be a high risk. I would even call it catastrophic risk. And that's mm -hmm. how science has been focusing in all its research for decades. And this is where the red embers diagrams come up. And as you may know, over the past four IPCC assessments, 20 years of science, 2001, third assessment of science, that risk assessment was that really, really catastrophic risks would only occur at five, six degrees Celsius of global warming, which basically meant that the risk assessment from science was that that was a, that was a non-existent risk. It was a very, very low probability because nobody was suggesting that we were moving towards five, six degrees Celsius of warming. I mean, for heaven's sake, that's a place we haven't been in for the past eight, nine million years. 20 years later, 2018, the 1.5 degrees Celsius report, and then comes the sixth assessment of the IPCC, and the red embers risk analysis is down at two degrees. So the scientific advancements, the more we learn about the coupled, self-regulating, biophysical Earth system and all the planetary boundaries, we, we must conclude that even in the mainstream of science, because IPCC is, as you know, the consensus across the entire scientific community, that actually the catastrophic risk threshold is now coming uncomfortably close, mm -hmm. very close into the Paris range, actually. And if you then combine that with the IPCC six assessment, conclusion that our remaining global carbon budget to have any chance of landing, of a safe landing around 1.5, is only 400 billion tons of carbon dioxide, which translates to only 9.5 years of remaining emissions at current rate of fossil fuel burning, you talk of run of time having run out. So you, you have evidence today that time is running out. We've reached the decisive decade for humanity's future on Earth. The only chance to now have a safe landing is, is a fundamental immediate turnaround multiplied by approaching catastrophic risk equals emergency. So the planetary emergency is, is, is not something that has come, let's say, just as a kind of a lightweighted conclusion. It is based on, on tremendous careful assessment and is, we conclude, in the scientific community at large, the position we're in right now. So that's, that's what we had in our luggage, in our mental luggage, when we went to Glasgow. We had all the evidence that nine out of the 15 tipping element systems that we know not only regulates the climate system, but also have thresholds. And if you push them too far, they can cross tipping points. Among those 15, you, you know them. I mean, you have the Greenland Ice Sheet, you have the Arctic Summarize, you have the Jet Stream, you have the uh, overturning of heat in the North Atlantic. You have the whole uh, El Nino system. You have West Antarctic Ice Shelf, the Amazon Rainforest, you know, all the big, biophysical systems that we've now learned not only regulates the state of the planet, that's why they have to stay within a safe operating space of planetary boundaries, but also they have multiple stable states. And they have so far for 12,000 years since we left the last ice age, been on the right side of the fence in support of humanity. Why? Well, because they have so-called negative feedbacks. They dampen and, and reduce stress posed by external forcing. In the past, that external forcing was volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and solar orbital forcing. Today, it's our human forcing. But the system has been resilient. 
It's been remarkably capable of dampening and reducing impacts. Now we're seeing cracks in the system. You may be aware that one year before COP, we're talking now just at the beginning of the pandemic, we published a scientific paper mapping all these tipping elements showing that nine out of 15 are starting to show signs of instability. That is, as you can imagine, a bit of a scientific nightmare. Not that they have crossed tipping points, but they're showing signs of not being in the resilient, healthy state that we depend on. Among them, you have the 15% slowdown of the overturning of heat in the North Atlantic, which we know uh, with quite high degree of certainty impacts the monsoon systems, both over South America and West Africa, which as you can imagine, can lead to cascades because it can lead to more droughts and forest fires in the Amazon and push the Amazon closer towards a tipping point where it would irreversibly move towards a savanna state. You have the accelerated melt of the Arctic summer ice. You have the accelerated melt and probably crossing a tipping point in the West Antarctic ice shelf. You have the tropical coral reef systems that you know so well that have been pushed uh, you know, across tipping points in several uh, parts of, of ocean marine systems across the world. The IPCC recognizes that five of these are now tipping points we cannot rule out. We published a research that nine are showing signs of instability. So I, I just wanted to, I, I draw a line there, but just say that this is, let's say the mental state of science coming to Glasgow. So it's not surprising therefore that uh, science with civil society and of course all the voices from youth uh, signals very clearly that this is the moment. This is our last chance, not to avoid that the planet suddenly falls over an escarpment, but our last chance to align all countries' plans with science. Of course, we don't solve the climate crisis at our climate negotiations, but this was the moment six years after Paris to close the books on, on all the outstanding issues in the Paris Agreement, but also update all the nationally determined contributions, the NDC plans, so that we could see a real credible plan towards a safe landing. This was the moment. And we even set up a list of what had to be fulfilled in, in Glasgow, and I'll kind of walk, walk through those. But what, what was then the, the, the high level outcome from, from my perspective of Glasgow? Well, I've tended to, to summarize it in the following way. So we, we go to Glasgow following a path towards disaster. So that, that's what I've been, been kind of summarizing. We know that has been calculated in quantitative terms as well as you know, that uh, we are at a, at a, you know, a 50% likelihood, not able to, to land lower than 2.7 degrees Celsius, which is a place we haven't been in for the past 4 million years. So clearly a catastrophic outcome. We leave Glasgow, what I would assess to be a pathway to danger. So what we accomplished in Glasgow was to go from disaster to danger. We went from a 2.7 pathway towards a potential 1.9 degrees Celsius pathway. And, and that is still in the red embers uh, range that I mentioned earlier, but it's of course a significant accomplishment. I, I would say that Glasgow was a, a very significant step forward, but it's only you know, one partial step now we have to kind of keep the momentum going because we're certainly not on, on a safe path. And remember that the if is enormous because the 1.9 calculation is, is very optimistic. It assumes that all countries deliver exactly what they've promised in their NDCs, their updated NDCs that were brought forward to Glasgow. They fulfill all the pledges, and I'll walk through the most important ones, all the pledges on methane, on deforestation, on coal phase out, uh, that that has to be basically delivered in full. But most importantly, all countries that have promised net zero pathways and, and emission reduction quantifications to 2030 have to deliver on those as well. And I say that because most of those are outside of the NDCs, they're, they're not kind of legally bound, they're not tied into the national plans, they are kind of pledges outside. So they have potentially kind of a lesser uh, legal weight. But if all of this is, is delivered upon, we, we have made a significant step forward. I mean, going from 2.7 to a 1.9 pathway means bending the global curve of emissions, and it means starting to follow the path 
that New Zealand has put itself towards, that the European Union has decided as well, namely a roughly 50% reduction of emissions by 2030 and continue cutting emissions by half each decade to have a net zero point around 2050. Did you know that that 90%, 90% of, of global emissions are today actually connected to zero uh, net zero pathways? That is rarely uh, communicated, but actually the United States, the European Union, China, and India have set net zero pathways. These are the four largest emitting uh, regions in the world. And not only that, three of them are the world's largest economies in the world, the European Union, China, and the US. Sure, India 2070 is 20 years too late. Sure, China latest 2060, it is too late. Sure, China still is, is, is involved in investments on fossil fuels abroad. Sure, we don't have Russia on board properly, Indonesia on board properly. We would need much more engagement from Brazil and Canada and Turkey. But still, you know, when you look at the numbers, the pledges that are now on the table are actually quite, you know, significant slash remarkable. That we now have an agreement on over 100 countries in the world having committed to halt deforestation by 2030, New Zealand being one of them. This covers 85% of forests on planet Earth. Of course, there's really, really good reason to be skeptical whether this will be delivered upon, but it's quantitative and it's now in place. The methane pledge that New Zealand also joined of a 30% reduction of, of methane emissions by 2031, 90 countries, two thirds of the global economy included is also significant. Sure, we are lacking India, Russia and China who are not on board, but it's, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a significant critical mass of countries moving forward. Over 40 countries commit to phase out coal. And the, of course, again, the largest coal economies are not on board like Australia, India, China, and the US. But I think that I share actually, uh, even though it's a kind of a bit of a popular statement, but I do share Prime Minister Boris Johnson's statement that this, this is probably the death bell on coal. It's, it's the writing is on the wall. And, and why is this? Well, it is of course, because the, the market parity in comparison with renewable energy systems have been passed even without subsidies. So, so it's not worth investing in coal and just look at what's happening in New Delhi as we speak, when, when the Indian government has to shut down schools for weeks because of the air pollution that is now basically making, making New Delhi impossible to, to live in. So we have uh, you know, a momentum. And if you pack on top of that 130 trillion that Mark Carney was able to kind of rally around the financial asset alignment with 1.5. The fact that we at least now have the 100 billion in the Green Climate Fund, it's far from enough, but it's at least a, a kind of a step forward. The fact that we've closed the Paris uh, rule book, all of this together, I think um, is, is significant, but it, but it can only mean something if you then link it to, to Rob's point here in the beginning, which is, the atmosphere in Glasgow. You know, the atmosphere in Glasgow <clears throat> is, in, you know, I, I've been like many of you to too many COP meetings. And, and this is probably the first COP meeting I ever been to that, that has two features that are, that are significantly different compared to previous COP meetings. Number one, for the first time, at least in my experience, you know, the countries are not battling over the direction of travel. The direction of travel is the Paris Agreement we're battling over the, the speed by which we are moving towards the goal. Meaning that all countries in the world are kind of swimming along the same swimming lane. It's just that they're keeping a different pace in that swimming lane. That's of course a much, much more constructive position to be in. Many journalists and, and media chose to be very um, critical to India that put a spanner in the wheel, you know, one minute to midnight by this concern over fossil phase out when they wanted to have a, a phase down. Well, you know, of course you can be critical, but, but you know, one should also recognize that two days before India announced that they will have 50% of their energy mix for electricity coming from renewables by 2030. And they set out a net zero pathway to 2070. 
And, and uh, we know scientifically that this was not a, a lightweight decision they took. There was a lot of analytics behind before Prime Minister Modi could, could step forward with that pledge. So, so they recognize that this is a, a, a tough business. It's difficult to do this transformation. It takes a lot of effort. And of course, it's a tremendous challenge politically to, to pull away the rug on all subsidies on coal, which is 70% of the energy and electricity provision for all you know, Indian average and low income households. I mean, I, I, I came back to stock to Sweden actually after after Glasgow and 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 uh, the opposition parties in my little country decided in a, in a in a budget decision in parliament that they had to reduce petrol prices in Sweden because it's too too big threat to uh, to the economy in, in average households in Sweden so of course one has to have a respect of the fact that this is not a question of fighting over direction it is rather a, a, a fight over over the speed of travel. And I think uh, we have been a little bit too, uh, too tough on India here uh, because one has to recognize how, how challenging this is for, for all uh, rapidly emerging economies in the world. So that's on COP26, uh, much left to be done. We've certainly not come far enough. And I want to say that perhaps the most important sentence in the Glasgow Agreement in my mind is the sentence that now says that every country is urged to update their NDCs every year, every year. So it's not a kind of a five year waiting point now, the momentum has to be with, withstood. And that's where I think uh, we, we come into this question, what about New Zealand? I think, I think New Zealand can really help here and, and be one of those countries that, that can show an alignment with science, updating regularly. I mean, you have ambitious plans, but, they need to be updated to be really aligned with a 50% per decade um, halving of emissions, to be even more forthcoming on the phase out of coal. I understand that you actually have a, have a, a trajectory towards increase import of coal rather than decrease. So there are, of course, improvements needed to be done also in, in New Zealand. And then finally, just say two words on, on planetary boundaries. I mean, how does all this connect with planetary boundary science? Well, it connects in a very profound way because we know that there is no safe Paris landing only by phasing out fossil fuels. We also need to secure the natural carbon sinks in nature, all the tipping elements I've talked about before, and transition the global food system from the single largest source to becoming a sink, a major shift from being a culprit to a solution. So that requires coming back into the safe space on water, on nitrogen, on phosphorus, on biodiversity, on land, and on carbon. So you have five of the planetary boundaries required to align with science in order to deliver the 1.5 degrees Celsius safe landing. Therefore, I think countries like, like New Zealand that are just among a handful of countries, together with Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany, who've been trying to really take on board this broader systems perspective of understanding that the climate landing is about a global sustainability transformation. And we have to find ways of doing this in an exponential transformative way because of the speed of travel. But we also recognize that this can only be done in ways that give win-win uh, outcomes for health, for human well-being, for jobs, for the economy. And I think that's my plea to, to, to every political leader and business leader or any, any group of citizens in the world today to help and continue developing this narrative that I think the Edward uh, Hillary Fellowship and, and the Institute is entirely you know, on board on that you know, global sustainability and sustainability in general being the very pathway towards prosperity and equity. I mean, th this, is, this is the future and it's the future we want. And, and I think that will help us also in, in keeping the momentum post Glasgow because it is definitely needed. Back to you, Rob. Uh, fine, thank you very much indeed, uh, Johan. That was absolutely superb because you've uh, brilliantly um, summarized all that was achieved in uh, Glasgow, uh, but very realistic about the work ahead. 
Can I just pick up on a couple of points very briefly? Um, the 1.9, where's that analysis coming from versus I think carbon tracker, carbon action tracker was about 2.4 towards the end of COP. Uh, who, who's done the one point, who's come up with the 1.9 number for what the impact of the NDCs is? Yeah, no, it's a great, very important question. And, and if you check the carbon action tracker latest updates, they, they, have, they include also the 1.8 and 1.9. And, and the difference is, is really important. 2.4 is where you land if you only include, let's say, the formally, the formally, um, let's say, uh, yeah, the formally included pledges, so everything that is inside the NDCs, then you land at 2.4. But if you add to that everything that happened, let's say, outside of the negotiating rooms, so the so the India net zero pledges, the methane pledges, the, the deforestation pledges that happened in the first week outside of the negotiation rooms, then you can uh, then you land with the same models at 1.9. So it is it is also the International Energy Agency, and it is a former colleague at the Potsdam Institute who's now at the Melbourne University, uh, Malte Meinshausen, who's brought forward those, those numbers. So it's a question of uh, if you bring in everything that has been promised, let's say, outside of the, of the formal part, then it brings you down to 1.9. So, of course, you could, you could argue those are, are more lightweighted or in, in terms of they, they are, are, we can be lesser certain that they will be implemented. But I, I think they should be taken seriously. Yes, uh, good. Thank you for um, filling that out. The second one was you mentioned two big things that were different at this COP versus the other. The, fir the first one was that there was this strong consensus around direction, but still an argument over speed. Was there a second point? Oh. Though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. This, this just shows it's, it's a late hour here in, in Berlin. Right. Sorry for that. Yes, I mean, the, the, the second one is very simple. I've, I've never seen so many CEOs spend so many days at a climate negotiation as in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. and, and I've not counted them. You wanted to count the, the average age. Let, let's, let's join forces, Rob, and, and <laughs> I'll count the CEOs and you'll count the age. I mean, Paris was extraordinary. We know this. This was where the World Business Council of Sustainable Development, where we mean business, behind the scenes, helped the political leadership to come to the Paris Agreement. But in Glasgow, I, I can, I mean, I think it was so significant to see CEOs from big multinationals to smaller SMEs, not only come and leave, but really spend time. And this is significant because it's obvious that they're there because they see that's where, let's say the markets, that's where the demand, that's where the preferences, that's where the innovation space, that's where the finance is moving. So, so that was the, 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 the kind of the buzz around the meeting with regards to uh, innovation and, and industry. Thank you. And let me turn uh, to Kirsty. Um, Kirsty, uh, you've got your hand up. Uh, but could you unmute yourself, please? And then love to hear your question. Oh, uh, very. You're very quiet. Oh, let me try. How's it? That's better. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, perfect. Hi, Johan. Uh, my name is Kissy. I'm the Director of the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment um, in Wellington. Um, my question was actually um, slightly peripheral to this, but around the Eat Lancet report. So it's been a couple of years since that came out. And I was wondering, um, you know, in those two, two years since it's been released, if the scientific thinking has changed around any of the recommendations that were made in that report. The authors and the scientific community still stand by those recommendations or perhaps have been tweaked a little bit since it's received some feedback. No, thank, thank, thanks, Kirsty. So this is the, the Eat Lancet Commission that uh, for the first time brought forward a, a, a scientific definition of what we call the planetary health diet to try and define quantitatively a healthy diet from sustainable food system as a, as a frame for, for all uh, regions and cultures uh, around the world. Um, I would argue that the science around the Eat Lancet Commission still stands. It, it was quite actively used and referred to during the United Nations Food Systems Summit earlier this year. And I can share with you, which is not public yet, so this is kind of an, uh, yeah, 
and an informal slash confidential piece of information that we are now going to launch um, a version two, uh, an update. So Eat Lancet Commission 2.0, uh-huh. because the science is advancing mm-hmm. and, and we want to make an update, but also work much more with regional um, you know, analysis of what does, what does healthy and sustainable diets imply for different uh, food cultures, geographies, nations in the world. And, um, and that will very likely be announced at the, at the World Economic Forum in January. So, so we're kind of kicking off a, a next phase of the Eat Lancet work. Well, that's uh, very good to hear because um, the first uh, report was immensely, uh, wonderfully influential. Um, and um, we've still got a lot of work to do here in New Zealand um, to shift the thinking on amongst our farmers um, who remain very resistant to reducing methane. Um, so uh, that's an update of Eat Lance. It will be very welcome. Thank you. Um, I know you've got to go off to another meeting. Y- you tell me if there's time for one more quick question or whether you, you, you need to scoot. I can take one more, one more question. Then I'll have to draw a line, I'm afraid. No, that's fine. Thank you. Peter, um, in Torong, lovely to see you online. Uh, your question, please. Good, uh, Johan. Um, I asked in 2018 at the New Frontiers Conference if you could measure um, anything, if it was possible to measure anything, what would have the most impact? I think your answer was real-time biodiversity. I'm wondering if you would update that or revise it now, or um, if you stick by it, if there's been any serious progress in that area. Oh, yeah, that's that's a great, great follow-up, Peter. Great, great to see you again. And... Um, yeah, I'm almost a bit sorry to say that uh, if if I get that question again, which you're posing, I think my answer would still be real-time monitoring of, of uh, what we call biosphere integrity, but the, the richness of species and the, and the stability or resilience of, of the living biosphere. What I would perhaps tilt towards, though, today compared to when we met last time, is the ocean to, to really dive into the ocean because we're we are working right now and that's one of the things that the ar6 the ipc ar6 also identified that you know the the big the big question mark is if if we succeed in in phasing out fossil fuels and and halting emission of greenhouse gases the big greenhouse gases carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide um how will the earth system respond and, and all climate models show uh, quite optimistically that the oceans will basically mop up large parts of, of, uh, of the damage caused by us, basically by absorbing carbon dioxide and that the biological pump in the ocean will gradually have the carbon sinking down to the, to the sea floor. And, and we're many, many scientists, and, and I'm not an oceanographer, but many, many oceanographers that are, you know, quite quite concerned about that analysis if you would meet Sylvia Earle my big hero on on ocean exploration and and science she will tell you that you know we know so little about the living biological parts of the ocean and what play what role they play in in all the nutrient cycling and the carbon cycling and thereby the stability of of the planet so I think I would probably be um dive down into the ocean, but answer roughly the same, in the same way. Um, fabulous question and terrifically interesting answer. Thank you. Uh, we're very conscious we've got the fourth largest EEZ in the world and uh, very special oceans in the lower half of the South Pacific and then the Southern Oceans. Um, so uh, a, a very big task there for us. Thank you. Uh, we should let you go. But as ever, thank you hugely for your um, huge knowledge and wisdom, but also with the uh, fantastic clarity with which you communicate that, which is cold-eyed and realistic but very um, empowering as well and um, gets us off to a very good start this morning so thank you go well and we look forward to staying in touch yeah wonderful to be with you good luck during the day bye everyone bye there thanks johan uh uh, well that really was a superb session and, and as ever johan is completely extraordinary about his ability to be constantly learning and analyzing and sort of recalibrating, reassessing, and um, never hesitates. 
um, to tell us when um, the facts or a new focus has emerged um, that we have to take uh, uh, very careful, pay very careful attention to. And thank you for the two wonderful questions there as well. Now, it's a great pleasure to turn to Vicky Robertson, um, Secretary of the Ministry for the Environment, and, and also, of course, a, a fellow. And um, it's wonderful to have uh, Vicky in those dual roles, uh, to which I'd add a third as to one of the founders, the Aotearoa Circle, um, which is very importantly putting natural capital at the centre of so many decisions that government and business make. Um, and um, uh, making very good progress on that, first of all, on sustainable finance, and now roadmaps emerging for food systems and um, transport and the like. So, Vicky, wonderful to have you with us, and um, over to you. Oh, tēnā koutou katoa, ki uh, no uri nai tahu aho, ko Vicky Robertson uh, aho, tutumu whakaari uh, mō manatū, ta manatū motutāo. Um, so I'm the Secretary for the Environment as um, Rod Rod said, um, great to be with you today and always lovely to see uh, EHF fellows. I'm always buoyed by the optimism that comes with being with a group of fellows. So um, great to see you all today. Always hard to uh, follow Johan. So um, I'm going to drop us down into Aotearoa uh, and what's happening here um, uh, with that global context in mind, which is really important for us all to remember. And I'll start with a couple of things that that Johan said. One is um, agree with him on the the kind of climate denial now is really around the pace of change and that is as much for New Zealand as it is around the world and the, the argument in New Zealand goes something like this. We're one of the best in the world and we've got a different profile than the rest of the world, special, uh, and therefore our contribution, we need to be careful about our contribution uh, in, the, in the world. We need to see what other people are doing. Um, in saying that too, the second part I would agree with, with Johan is um, in New Zealand, we have this unique opportunity to think about it, not just as a climate change issue for us, but actually the system of change that needs to happen. So on land, the things that we do to uh, affect our climate uh, outcomes also help with our nitrogen outcomes, our biodiversity and our water quality outcomes. So for a small country, uh, we can think in that systems way. And I think that's one of the opportunities EHF fellows um, can actually step into in helping us come to some solutions there. So just, um, I'm, you know, I, I try and be optimistic because I think we need to be dealers in hope uh, that we can actually crack this in the next decade or so. And I think uh, Aotearoa New Zealand is well positioned. Of course, there's much more we can do. And there is lots that we haven't done. So we have, we are starting from a place where we need to build action really quickly. Just a reminder that we have a strong architecture in New Zealand, which I'm starting to see really uh, get us on the right track for climate action. So our architecture with a, a zero carbon act, which sets targets for the country, domestic targets. Our international cut targets are, are important, but it's our domestic targets that will drive action in, in New Zealand that are, I think are, are incredibly important for us. So we have that. As part of the, our architecture, we have the Climate Commission, an independent body who provides both advice on what our budgets should be to meet those targets, but also monitors how we're going. Uh, and they have a role in adaptation as well. So we're starting to see that architecture um, really uh, both give us a strong view of what is needed, uh, but also we'll start to uh, monitor uh, how we're going. So I think that's uh, a really a good successful model. Uh, and, and we're using others uh, experience in that the UK model is, you know, it's modeled on, on, on their approach. Um, so we've had the Climate Commission's first advice on, on what the budgets, this is basically the how, how much emissions we need to reduce over five year periods to, to start to meet the targets in the next while. We've had that advice. They also helpfully did advice on, um, well, gave some indication of some demonstration pathways that showed under existing technology, we could actually meet those targets. So they've done their work and now it's the job of government to look at what the plan should be. And we are currently consulting on emissions reduction plan. 
so um, that's that's the architecture piece piece, and it's I think it is really good. You'll notice if you, any of you looked at the emissions reduction plan that's out for consultation at the moment, there's a gap between that plan and what the budgets are that we need to meet. So we've got work to do in terms of the plan uh, and, our, and our ambition level, particularly in this first period uh, where we need to really get action going quickly. The reason why I'm just focusing on that is because um, that plan will set out what is needed for the next 15 years. And it's not just what government needs to do. This is going to be a whole of society effort. And uh, the, the, the um, important point in there that I think Johan was um, alluding to is we need a plan and an action that brings everybody along. Uh, uh, the impacts of climate change will disproportionately fall on different parts of the community, our vulnerable parts of our community, uh, Māori and Pacifica in particular, uh, and others that um, we cannot afford and we shouldn't uh, ignore uh, the need to bring them along uh, in, in the journey, but also um, make sure that we make change happen that allows them to, to be part of that as well. Um, so uh, other action that's happened in the last little while that uh, Rod alluded to, um, well, one, one is on the public sector side, I'll call it public sector, but it's actually uh, dealing with process heat in, in hospitals and in schools, so coal boilers. Uh, there's also a fund that is starting to get into uh, process heat in the private sector as well. So um, a good start there, but uh, Johan's right. Our approach to coal needs to, um, we need to keep on that track. Uh, we also are the first country to introduce mandatory disclosures of climate risk. Now that is a significant shift in what will the board conversations boards will be having about the future financial uh, risk of climate change. And that's a significant shift, I think, and will impact uh, uh, at board level across the country. Uh, we also have uh, legal, uh, done legal opinions through the Aotearoa Circle uh, around the liability of directors for climate risk. Um, so quite a significant, um, you know, this is an academic exercise uh, is something that New Zealand can think about in the future To It's here, it's now, we need to think about it and we need to have plans and actions in place. So significant shift in there. The other thing Rod alluded to is that uh, revolution, I would say, in New Zealand, uh, you know, two years ago, we had no system of sustainable finance at all. Uh, we didn't talk about it. Uh, we, um, I've been arguing with Treasury even when I was in there about having green bonds. Uh, we didn't have uh, any sort of, basically it was, you know, this is a market that New Zealand doesn't need. Uh, and yet there were trillions of um, dollars uh, floating around the world around uh, investment in sustainable finance. So through the Aotearoa Circle, we have unlocked that. Uh, and now we see banks offering uh, different types of loans for sustainable action. Uh, we've got the Treasury uh, announcing last week uh, a green bond in their own portfolio. Uh, we uh, have a different approach to funding and financing, and there's more coming in the, in the emissions reduction plan. For the first time, we have seen, we've got agreement to hypothecation of ETS revenue. Uh, that is a significant shift in approach to tax uh, revenue. Uh, it's not going to be enough to meet our climate action plans, but it's, it's a significant change in mindset about how do we deal with, and recognition, I think, that this is an emergency in New Zealand. Um, so in saying all of that, uh, a whole lot of action needs to happen. So I'm less interested in debating targets and I'm more interested in the action plan from here. And I think that's where New Zealand needs to focus because that's where our opportunity is to be world leaders and some of the things that um, need cracking uh, in terms of climate response. So in the ERP for you EHF fellows, I would, I would really look into the kind, both the targets that um, within sectors we're, we're going for, uh, and also the opportunities that exist within those sectors. So uh, you'll see a lot in the transport space and the shift, not just to electrification of vehicles, but the, the shift out of people out of cars and how do we do that? Uh, in energy, that's a big space for, even though we're you know, very renewable energy in New Zealand, there is still 
a huge amount of opportunity in the energy space. Um, and I know I talked to fellows, a, 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 you know, a few years ago and said, oh, that's not our biggest issue. But now I'm revising my view on that and thinking that actually uh, energy is one of our um, critical areas where New Zealand could crack some some changes here and you've got a new chair in uh, Anna Komenik who is actually you know into uh, a different way of flying uh, you know could New Zealand be the world leaders in the domestic fleet is that is an electri electrified fleet for example um, uh, in the waste area and, and a few of you are in that space so you um, the commission budget basically puts quite a lot more uh, uh, responsibility on the waste sector for methane reduction. Uh, so it's about 11% 11, 11 over, um, over the period of the budgets. And so, uh, and, and it's, you know, people know that uh, we, are, we are starting from scratch on waste. New Zealand's one of the highest waste uh, producers in the OECD uh, per capita. Uh, so we have currently a waste strategy out and we are looking at waste changes and waste legislation, but there's going to be a whole lot of investment in shifting uh, both uh, at the top end of the hierarchy, which is getting people out of buying uh, crap in the first place, uh, but but also in, in some of the, how, what, how do we deal with our waste in New Zealand? Uh, and methane is a big part of that. And then finally, the chapter on ag is light. Uh, and so I'll say the positive on, on, on ag. So the, the, th the opportunities in there for New Zealand is cracking the, the approach to methane. Uh, and, you know, there's a question about how you do that. Um, I, I think at some point we also will need to think about land use change. Uh, and, and that that goes to uh, Kirsty's question about our food system and and how it impacts on environment more and more, more generally, and, and how do you think about the mix of um, what you're growing. Uh, we have currently a backstop in legislation. In 2025, agriculture comes into the ETS for its emissions, uh, but it comes in, uh, in, in that legislative backstop at 95% uh, free allocation, so only 5%. So that's the legislative backstop that all comes in in 2025. If at the, and that, that will happen, we'll be the first in the world to put a price on agriculture emissions. However, it's uh, only at 5%, so uh, probably won't impact at a pricing way on, on the level of emissions uh, in agriculture at that level. Currently, we have a partnership going on considering other options other than that back, backstop. So one of our critical uh, eyes on that is that actually could we get a better result that actually incentivize farmers to reduce emissions uh, and, and um, um, basically rewards them for doing that. The other part of uh, ag system is, which I know a lot of the fellows are um, interested in, is the farm system change. So under the Climate Commission's modelling, they modelled that um, if we could buy uh, a certain day, and I think it was uh, not with 2020, have all farmers at um, best practice farm system level, then that would have a, a quite an impact on um, the their contribution to emissions. Um, there's some debate about that, but I think the the point on I would say on that is um, farmers believe in New Zealand that they are best in the world in practice, and our challenge is how do we keep them better better in the world. Uh, in that practice and farm system change, regenerative agriculture, um, what does that mean? How do you get integrity around that? Uh, I think is a, a, absolutely an opportunity and we're seeing quite a shift in, in the top farmers uh, on that. Um, so I just, I think that's probably all I wanted to say, Rod, I'm happy to take questions as well. Um, uh, the planetary boundaries work is um, we did with uh, uh, Johan and uh, and uh, we did as EHF fellows actually uh, with MFE backing and that is on our website. There is some difficulty in it in New Zealand because it's a because of our per, it's a per capita um, uh, type model, but it is worth having a look at in terms of the safe boundaries and showing that at a New Zealand level we're um, exceeding those boundaries on a number of the the planetary um, boundaries um, approach across nitrogen, for example, um, 
uh, in our water quality. Um, so none of that's a surprise, but um, it's worth having a look at and a different way of thinking about things. Um, so that's probably all I wanted to say. Um, happy to take questions. I think there was one in the chat now. Um, uh, yes, thank you, Vicky. Yeah, uh, so I, to I'm you. going to ask one quick question, if I may. Um, to what extent is um, biodiversity and ecosystems coming through in the emissions reduction plan um, in terms of making sure we focus on rebuilding those and um, push harder towards um, establishing credits for them and, and other financial flows into those? Yeah, and I think this is... Um... I, th I don't think it's as strong as it could be. Uh, and I think that's mainly because um, uh, it's a little bit like when we first got into the sustainable finance conversation, it feels a bit like we're not sure how, how that we can make that happen. Um, but I think there's more that we could do in terms of nature-based solutions. We are looking at biodiversity, how do you get biodiversity credits, uh, um, both from a climate point of view, but also from a biodiversity uh, point of view. And that, and that work is, um, being undertaken at the moment and I think there's some exciting things that could happen in there and when you talk to people outside of the public sector they say well of course there's a market here and people are really wanting it it's just how do we actually get that up and running I think is our is our challenge hmm. but welcome well, absolutely welcome uh, thoughts and um, ideas around how do we accelerate some of that that change as well Thank you. And just picking up on Johan's um, very important observations about oceans, um, mm. the government is not planning to do anything uh, to start work on a, a, our first oceans policy until next term, should they win the next election. Um, can you give us a bit more of a feel for what the thinking is within MFE and elsewhere in government on oceans policy? Yeah, and I think, um, to be honest, I think the 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 dance card of change at the moment across a number of fronts is quite large. So we're doing uh, the start of this climate change action. We're doing resource management reform, uh, still doing freshwater implementation of freshwater quality and the waste area. Um, so I think there's just a feeling at the ministerial level with COVID, to be frank, um, that the ability to, for our constituent communities to engage on, on another a uh, big issue uh, it might be might be too much. So what they've decided to do is work on some specific things on oceans in this term of government, mm -hmm. with an eye to uh, thinking about this as a, as um, the next. And I think for MFE, um, you know, our capacity to do this is is limited right now. But absolutely recognise um, the role of oceans, not just for climate change, but actually it's an area that we don't know a lot about. Uh, in our own environmental reporting, um, you know, we know some things, but we don't know a lot. So, so to Johan's questions about what is the impact if we're successful about uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction on our oceans, you know, we'd be struggling to to answer that for poor New Zealand. Um, but there's so there's a lot of work to do, and I think um, a lot of um, opportunity to to kind of partner with others to help us get that that piece of those pieces of work on the agenda for for, for next term, no matter what. Uh, form of government we've got. Fine, thank you. Um, Bex, uh, you've got a, a, a question in the chat box. W would you like to ask Vicky yourself rather than me reading um, about, um, uh, particularly about uh, the vulnerable communities one? Yeah, sure. So um, Vicky, you touched earlier on the the aspects of the fact that we've got vulnerable communities, both in a socio-demographic way, but also in a geographical sense. Um, and there are a number of communities, obviously um, this is quite top of mind for us here in Otatahi because there's a there's an adaptation framework that's been posed to the coastal communities. And I think there's tens of thousands of people um, in the Christel, Christchurch coastal wards that are now being imminently impacted um, by the impacts of climate change. And I guess my question is around what are, the national conversations happening around mitigation at this point, because I think that my observation living in one of these geographically compromised areas is that the approach is quite ad hoc and it actually is, it's quite changeable even between suburbs in the same city. Um, so I'd love to know what conversations are happening sort of at a higher level around that mitigation piece. Yeah, do you mean adaptation? Um, well, it, it, it either. Um, yes. So whether we're talking about managed retreat or we're talking about uh, you know stop banks and and flooding yes. uh, mitigation measures, whatever oh, okay. whatever it is yeah. that those those conversations are happening at a at a national level uh, yeah. for the people who are living in areas that are already actually at quite imminent risk. Yeah. So um, 
so uh, there's three things I'd say about that. We're, there's There's been a national risk assessment, which has, you know, 43 risks across the country and government um, uh, are working through basically a, a national adaptation plan that is due mid next year around all of those risks. Uh, and so that kind of gives a sense of how we might approach those. Um, we also, under the Resource Management Reform Programme, uh, the third leg of that is a, a new Climate Change Adaptation Act. I don't, that won't be passed this term, but it, deal, it starts to get into managed retreat and whose responsibility it is, because at the moment it's really unclear. Uh, and, and the sticking point in there is who, who funds and finances managed retreat when it's, when it's needed. Um, also in that RM reform, getting really clear on council's responsibility around climate change. Uh, so at the moment, they don't officially have a responsibility, uh, a legal responsibility under any act for climate change adaptation. So getting really clear about those responsibilities is really, so the architecture getting that in place. But to your point about this is happening for communities right now, how do we engage with them? And, and we have some work going with um, a group uh, it's called Eharangi, it's through the uh, Iwi Chairs Forum, particularly with Māori communities about um, understanding and awareness around uh, how, how um, climate change is going to impact their communities. So doing data work around flyovers to show how that's going to impact communities and starting to engage uh, them in the conversation around what does that mean for them? Uh, what are their approaches to that? Uh, that's in early days, and I wonder whether that's also a bit of a, a blueprint for how we might talk to other communities as well. But we wanted to start with the Māori communities who, generally speaking, are going to be hardest hit um, in, in the rural and small areas. Yeah. Mm. Th thank you. And uh, AJ, um, I, you've got your hand up. I'd love to hear your question, please. Oh, hi. <clears throat> Thanks, Rod. Um, oh. Sorry, though. Yes. Um, so the um, I'm sort of grappling with how, how exactly to, to formulate this without treading on too many toes. So let me just tread on toes and people can throw shoes at me as appropriate. <laughs> I'm often quite frustrated by the way it seems like when we get together and have conversations around facing the future, confronting the future, dealing with the future, what we actually seem to be doing is walking backwards into it. Um, we constantly have our eyes on the past, which is fine for information, but we always seem to be solving yesterday's problems saying we're going forward. Um, and as anybody who's spent a lot of time walking around town backwards will know, the only real question in there is how long does it take before we fall on our backside? And for instance, one of the things that's popped up already between Johan and yourself, Vicky, um, is the, the conversation, let's say, around our dairy sector, our methane emissions, our, our, our agriculture. I have my own pet pet project, but I'm not going to talk about that one in an effort to try and avoid being that guy who always talks about his pet project. So I'm going to talk about, or offer a question about agriculture in a way. We talk about um, reducing methane reduction from, from dairy and from agriculture. We talk about New Zealand's farmers being the most efficient in the world, which you really have to wiggle yourself around some particular linguistic blocks to make that true. It's true so long as we forget that we then have to export our product to wherever the market is on a refrigerated or dried dairy basis, whatever. The actual futurists, if you like, Johan and the Lancet folks, don't say the solution is about reducing the amount of methane coming out of dairy. It's about saying, stop eating dairy. You know, where is the, what's the appetite for the actual solution, which might just be to stop doing a harmful thing rather than trying a 20% reduction in the amount of harm it puts out. Um, is there any appetite, perhaps I put it in the government phrasing, is there any appetite for solutions that are actually solutions as opposed to merely politically palatable mitigations? Um, you know, I have to give full credit to the ICA campaign, for instance. They say, stop doing the things that are damaging. But there seems to be very little follow through on that. It all seems to be about tinkering around the edges and 20% reductions here and 8% reductions there. Um, when some of the more simple solutions might be staring us in the face, but just not so, so they, they tread on toes perhaps. I, I, feel, I feel a little bit like with the dairy conversation, we're having a conversation in the fifties about if we just put filters on the end of cigarettes, that'll fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think um, 
don't really want to, uh, I, mean, I think it's a really good question and a good challenge. And I think it's something we should be asking ourselves across uh, all sectors. So even in the, I, you know, overheard it. So in waste, for example, we're trying to phase out plastic stickers on fruit. So I heard a, a whole lot of reasons why why we desperately need plastic stickers on fruit uh, to differentiate our pro product overseas. So, I mean, we, each sector makes makes various arguments on this. I think the thing we try and, I mean, obviously there's a political thing here um, and I can't speak to that, but um, there's a real balance between how do you bring communities along with you who are, who are big and invested in, in, in their current state uh, and create change at the same time. And I, I think this is the opportunity for EHF. I always think about, you know, change happens from those at the edge. So how do we get the edge happening more? Um, and, and you know, uh, most of my life is spent with those in the middle and on the in the laggards and trying to regulate those up to a certain level, right? I don't think that creates innovation. I don't think that creates real change uh, at a at a you know really fundamental level. But it does it does change the dial, if you like. So I think that's where I've always been an advocate of, of EHF fellows really leaning into the edge of of what's needed in Aotearoa and and creating change that people can see and feel and and not be then afraid of making the shift. And that, and that's I think the um, because otherwise, if you don't, people have got nothing to fill the vacuum with, and so they they fill it with fear, and 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 we don't get change. You see that with vaccinations and unvaccinations, right? Um, if it's a fear-based conversation, then you know people fill that with all sorts of things that that aren't real. I mean, I think on the you know we've lent, if MFB have kind of gone out on a limb and said our food, the way we produce food, is impacting. You, you know New Zealand's uh, environment mm. and that has been we've we've got quite hammered on that uh, it's not your job you shouldn't be saying that how do you uh, our food system is the best in the world but we have to we have to deal in the science of what's actually happening mm. um, so I think that's that's my answer to that without getting political about it or giving any personal opinion I think the challenge exists across our economy you know in, in all sectors um, yeah it's a good question Keep asking. <laughs> um, yeah, now, in terms of other questions, we've got about 15 minutes. And um, I can see that there's about 63 people online. But um, if you've got your video off, I can't see your hand up. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, please do just switch your video on and put your hand up. I've now got two. That's fantastic. And indeed, I knew that to be so was one of those people. So to be so wonderful to see you online. Um, and uh, your you. question, please. Yes. So I want to ask, uh, what kind of uh, environmental evaluation uh, tools or methods do you use in New Zealand right now that informs particularly you say mitigation mitigation so what is that informed by and is it demand side based or supply side based uh, supply side based meaning along the lines of energy valuation where you can actually get to know the dollar value of each and every natural resource and see it go down and be able to come up with systemic healing solutions because governments, as we know from systemic thinking, tend to want to balance as a mitigation, as opposed to heal over time and let it reinforce. Uh, so maybe I'll just stop there. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think we are still developing our tools, I would say. Um, uh, so we don't have a natural capital approach, per se. Um, uh, but in, under the well-being framework or the living standards framework, there are indicators that are used uh, in, in that framework, uh, including a shadow price uh, for carbon uh, for emissions that is intended. Um, and with, in thinking about any policy, we're supposed to evaluate with a shadow price. What happens if you don't, or if you do um, go with this policy in terms of emissions? So that's a start, but probably doesn't go quite to where you were indicating. Thank you. Uh, um, Jennifer, um, I see your question in the chat, but please do ask it. That'd be lovely. Thank you. Okay. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, 
Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is Jennifer Wilkins. I work in uh, impact management and uh, look at uh, emerging practices and business sustainability. And so my question is um, really focused on Black Friday, which, com which is coming up next week. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a lot of retailers sell, you know, selling a lot of textiles and electronics and things like that. So I'm more interested in where we're at on the issue of a border carbon tax on imported goods, because that might be quite a good mechanism to reduce embodied carbon on imports and also reduce consumption. Thanks. Yeah, that's I, I, I agree on the Black Friday issue. In fact, I went into a toy shop with my mokupuna um, last week and I was horrified. <laughs> I have, obviously haven't been in one for a few years. Um, uh, but uh, we're not, that's the imported uh, carbon tax is not something we're looking at at the moment and probably more from a trade um, trade perspective than anything else. Although the conversations in those, tra those trade agreements are starting to come with uh, uh, not quite uh, tax uh, barriers uh, to importation across countries, but but are having, like there's a climate chapter in the, in the current UK uh, agreement, for example. Um, so we're not, we're not looking at that specifically, but I think it is being raised um, as, an, as an issue through the trade agreements at the moment. Um, Jennifer, if I might just chip in a, a, a thought on that. Um, obviously, the people to watch are the EU who are very serious about uh, carbon uh, uh, border adjustment uh, mechanisms. And um, the next phase of their work is going to be coming out uh, in another few months' time. Um, and uh, they're going to be the real test as to where, how other countries respond. Um, Speaking personally, I'm disappointed that New Zealand, which has always been on the leading edge of um, the, the intellectual processes around trade and being very articulate about um, what needs to happen in trade, um, I'm disappointed that uh, we're lagging on this very seriously. Um, and it would be um, a very good issue for us to um, um, put some effort behind uh, here in New Zealand. Thanks. Um, Adam, um, you had your hand up and your picture up at one point. Oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. Adam, and are you home in Toronto? Yes, yes, oh, well, home in Toronto. Greetings. Yes, wishing, wishing I was watching Rachel in, um, in Nelson and just wishing I was there hearing the birds in the background. <laughs> it's a cold, cold day here. Um, good evening, uh, um, Vicky, nice to, or good morning, nice to see you. Um, I work in the built environment and have spent the last few years very um deeply enmeshed in 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 the housing issues in in new zealand and um the 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 interconnected uh, uh layers of of inefficiencies um that drive our housing system in new zealand is um pretty well documented pretty well known um and there's a a, a real uh, opportunity for the government to facilitate amongst the few players within the industry, larger players, a, 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 a thought process around decolonization, decarbonization. And I'm wondering if any, I mean, I'm wondering if any of the um, discussions uh, are really about really systems change on that level um, for the housing sector. Uh, we're doing a study right now here in Ontario, first in the world, that's looking at embodied energy within um, existing building practice. And uh, the study is preliminary, but right now it's looking like uh, with very little change, we can get to a net carbon sink in our in our wood frame buildings um, with very little change in, in finance uh, dollars. That's not the same in New Zealand. We've looked at it and New Zealand, we lack product and we lack diversity. So there's a whole nother issue. But it seems to me the way that to approach the issue uh, within within housing um, within New Zealand is really to take to, to start encouraging consensus amongst stake, stakeholders to focus on the outcomes that we're looking for, which means changing the minds of some very large companies. Uh, and I'm wondering if those are if those discussions are going on yet um, or, or, or 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 even being considered because. I, I, in our sector, in the housing sector, I just I, I just don't see a way through unless we change the, the very roots of the system. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Adam. Um, I think the, the conversations are what I would call nascent. Um, so we've just, uh, I think through the, 
I think we have an entry in through the emissions production plan with a building and construction sector chapter, uh, and that's starting to raise exactly the issues that you uh, are talking about. And uh, last week we had an engagement with some of the private sector in that industry uh, uh, and thinking about how we do do that conversation through the construction sector accord as well. Um, and it's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day who's doing a whole housing uh, uh, development uh, through Māori iwi and, and talking and asking them, well, what's your approach on on lowering em your emissions profile through through that housing? And they said, oh, we just, you know, increases the cost and, and, and we can't do it right now. We just need the houses, you know. So it, I, I absolutely agree. It's a, a mindset shift. It is possible. Um, it's one of those how do we build it so they come uh, type conversations. Uh, and, and well, a huge well, they're, amount of they're not energy wrong. could be into that. They're I'm not sorry, wrong, they're, no, they're, they're not wrong. No, but everything costs wrong. in is, the short it, term. Yeah, mm. yeah, it's going to take some government intervention, I believe, or at least intervention to build consensus amongst the players because uh, the analysis in New Zealand currently is, yes, we, we it's almost impossible right now um, with the current market conditions. But those market conditions can be changed through consensus. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Thanks. Um, well, yes, thank you. And if I may turn to uh, Peter Ren Hilton, it's wonderful to see you online, Peter. And um, as you'll see on Peter's picture there, he's um, advertising uh, a very fabulous conference uh, coming up in 2035. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, Peter uh, is doing a substantial amount of leadership um, in the agritech space. So, Peter, what's your sense in terms of your um, agritech colleagues about um, the focus on um, technology to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from farming? But then also on the positive side of the ledger, well, that's positive, but the positive side of the ledger being able to measure, for example, soil carbon uh, uh, cheaply, effectively and um, precisely. Uh, well, first of all, Rod, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk uh, and answer those questions. Um, you'll be pleased to know <clears throat> that the 2035 conference <clears throat> is actually taking place in Auckland next April, so uh, we're not having to wait quite that far. Um, but the issue that you raise is a, a really valid one, um, and it goes back to some of the points I've been listening to in the last kind of hour. Um, I think one of the big questions is... Uh, very often, some of the changes we need to um, identify are going to be incremental rather than necessarily revolutionary. Uh, and one of the things we're trying to do with the 2035 conference is actually bring farmers with us to get buy-in from farmers. Um, and I think that's uh, a critical piece. And I think coming from the agritech sector, one of the um, issues I had with the Climate Change Commission report, particularly when it came to agriculture, was that the focus on technology was actually quite small. Um, and I think part of that is because it is still a moving piece. Um, we still um, are looking at things like, you know, methane inhibitors, methane vaccines um, for, for, for livestock. Um, and one of the um, issues therefore, I think is that a lot of these changes aren't gonna happen overnight, but step by step, they will. Um, one of the interesting uh, areas of um, agri-technology, clearly from a New Zealand perspective, is it is one area where potentially we could take some global leadership. Um, and I think that's something that is recognized by governments. Um, last year, they passed the Agritech uh, Industry Transformation Plan. And the whole idea of that was really to beef up the sector to help farmers and growers address the issues that they face, particularly around um, uh, reducing, um, obviously, greenhouse gas emissions, but also how do you continue to produce um, good quality produce um, in a changing climate? Um, and so I'm actually speaking on the session a little bit later today, but one of my hats I wear is as co-convener of the Western Growers Global Advisory Board. Uh, Western growers members produce over 50% of all fresh produce in North America. Um, and one of the challenges they face, particularly in places like California now, is not just labor issues, but issues around drought. Um, and so it's very easy to say, let's move from livestock to crops. But if you don't have enough water, um, that is a huge issue. And so what we're finding in North America right now, uh, in states like California, is that um, sectors such as strawberries are beginning to move out of California 
south to Mexico and further south than that into LATAM. And so there is a huge um, amount of investment now going into agri-technologies around things like robotics and automation to see how we can begin to address some of those systemic issues. So it's not just climate change. There are big issues taking place. And I think fundamentally the challenge we face is that by 2050, we know we're going to have 9.7 billion people in the world. We need to produce nutritious, affordable food. Um, but against that backdrop of a changing climate, uh, there are a number of challenges. And I think agri-technology has got a huge role to play in addressing some of those challenges. Thank you. May I just very quickly ask a follow-up question? What we see in sector after sector around the world is um, sectors, companies setting themselves extraordinary targets that they have absolutely no idea how to uh, develop the technology to get them there. Uh, electric vehicles has been a very good example of that. Um, and um, do you feel that the agricultural sector sweeping statement here um, in general um, is setting itself those very big goals and knowing that if you set those goals, that actually is an extraordinary driver um, of um, innovation and R&D and also of, of extraordinary attraction um, to government and then in later stages, uh, private sector money to fast forward that. Um, oh yeah, I, I absolutely think you're right. It, it's really interesting. Um, I, I was actually based in San Francisco back in the early, um, uh, well, between about uh, 2010 and 2013. Um, and it was only then that the whole concept of this new investment class of ag tech became, you know, be became aware. So we've only actually been working with agritech in terms of certainly venture and private funding really for about 10 years. Um, and so it's still very, very early days. And it was really interesting when I was in um, the Bay Area um, to speak to some of the large technology companies who suddenly realized that actually farming and agriculture was no longer just about um, you know, people getting up at five o'clock in the morning and going into the field. Um, it was all about data and digital. And suddenly they realized that it was a big thing that they'd missed. Um, and they could start applying a lot of the kind of Silicon Valley type technologies to agriculture, which is why we've seen that kind of exponential growth in investment into the sector. Um, and I think that is something that has been really evident through the whole COVID period. The actual amount of investment into agri-technology has increased uh, it, the huge amounts. I think AgFunder, which is a, a um, online um, um, investment kind of um, analytics group um, de detected that two years ago, there was something like $12 billion of fresh money coming in in terms of investments. The last 12 months, that's grown to $20 billion. So there is a massive amount of private sector money going into agri-technology um, to address some of these, as I said, really big issues. Um, and one of those issues is clearly being driven by climate, but also just the fact that we need to produce um, more more food to feed an, you know, an ever-growing population with uh, ever-declining natural resources. Um, and these are some of the issues, again, without promoting to the 2035 uh, summit too much, what we're going to be doing is bringing together um, researchers from across the uh, greater uh, Oceania region, from Australia and New Zealand, really to look at some of the research that's currently taking place to see how we can accelerate that research um, to address some of those, those key, key, key challenges. Fine. Uh, thank you. And um, if you're interested in knowing more about what Peter's up to, have a quick peek at the um, chat box, because um, there's a session uh, later on today uh, with the EHF um, fellows about that. You're very welcome to join. So um, thank you, Vicky, very much um, for being with us and, um, and wonderful to have so much of your time uh, and for all your uh, very helpful um, in insights and knowledge you've passed on to us. Um, thank you all for joining us in this session and for the great questions and discussion. Um, I'm just going to hand back to Rosalie now um, to tell us uh, what happens next uh, uh, in the second half of um, uh, this online program. Over to you, Rosalie. Thank you very much, Rod. Fascinating uh, discussion. So look, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to move to a short break. So this is a chance to stretch your legs, to get a cup of coffee or some breakfast. Um, this is also when the live streaming and the recording end. So I do want to thank all of you who tuned in. Um, what we're going to do after the break, because we recognize that there's, many of you will be listening, you'll have thoughts, there will be desire for discussion. 
So what we're going to do is um, we're creating two themes uh, for the breakout um, after our five minute stop. Um, the Action Pathway breakouts are really looking at some of the interconnected challenges. Um, theme one is really around our urban environments or cities, and that's looking at urban, urban form, urban precincts, uh, transport, and of course, when you start to think about transport, you also have to think about fuels, energy, bio, waste of biofuels, um, what and how we build, and nature in the city. When we get to theme two, which is more around nature restoration, this is where we have predator-free, endangered species, regenerative agriculture, which will of course be a critical area when we're thinking about methane, oceans, and also thinking here about uh, investment. So what we will do is invite you um, at the end of this to come in, you'll be able to choose which one you go into and um, this will be facilitated with someone taking notes. So uh, thank you, we'll join you shortly. We just suggest you turn off your video um, and mute yourself just while we take this break and we'll see you back at 9.35. Thanks. Very interesting thoughts um, in those sessions. So um, what we'd like to do is just for each of the four teams, um, just for somebody to give a popcorn snapshot, just some synthesis and some reflections from what you heard and from what you saw within that, um, uh, within that particular session. And maybe if we begin with the uh, urban environment one, who was leading in that group? I think that was us. I wouldn't say I was leading, but a couple of um, yeah. strong strong threads. Uh, one around the 15 minute cities as a theme, a potential theme for folks to be able to think through their work in context of the challenge um, from diverse perspectives. Um, and I'd love to hear from the other folks in the in the call, but from my with my EHF hat on, I think there was real value in just us taking these baby steps, first steps to have convened spaces with um, folks from the New Zealand ecosystem and some fellows on the call. But um, unfortunately, we didn't solve urban climate change <laughs> in uh, 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. You. <laughs> any any other any other comments from um from that team I, i'll just jump in because i i think so alec tang here our, our director of sustainability at kind order i i just think that there's um we talked about this opportunity to really use the fellows to get around this really important topic that has often been the domain of urbanists and environment you know and actually we need a broad range of voices industry um, you know, business and so on, to recognize the role that they play in creating these great cities. And, and I think, you know, it's not just about a city council, it's not just about the government. Actually, the, 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 the benefit that we see is for, for everyone and the need for everyone to be involved in creating these low carbon but resilient cities. We talked a lot about adaptation and the fact that we're, we're quite exposed here with a lot of coastline um, and the, the urgency around those conversations around adaptation. We focused on emissions reduction for a long time. That ad adaptation thing is happening now that we need to really recognize. And then the last bit was the equity and the just transition. So from my perspective, we have a lot of public housing. So how do we recognize the current inequities and that some of our transitions will exacerbate those inequities? Yeah if we're not careful. And sorry, one last thing is the interconnectedness around transport, urban development. So we talk about reducing our transport emissions, which is massive here in, in cities. To do that, we recreate our urban, urban environments. You know, we create those 50 minute cities. We'll actually tackle that transport emissions problem that we have. I look fantastic. That's a great <laughs> summary. Can we move to the urban environment group too? Was there anything to add for that? I'm not sure who was leading in that room. Um, well, it, it should have been Michelle, and I'm responsible for asking too many questions. So, Michelle, <laughs> do you want to feedback or should I? <laughs> Feel free, and if you've missed anything, I'll add in off my notes. 
Yeah, thank you. It was a wonderfully counterintuitive session because um, in, in thinking, rethinking urban environments, you're thinking about communities physically coming together. But both um, Matthew and, and Sam and a AJ were all talking about um, the power of uh, the, the metaverse of uh, um, on online reality. So at the far end of that, uh, from AJ's point of view, that would be a great way to do virtual tourism, for example, rather than having to bring people here. Um, but um, um, uh, Sam is very involved in um, uh, UNDP work on digital transformations. Um, and sees a role there, and um, and Matthew um, is working hard on um, on new models of, of community and collective ownership uh, for important assets um, in the urban environment. So, it, as I say, that's uh, was where our discussion went. And um, but if if any if any of you'd like to add some more, please do. Oh, Matthew, go ahead. Uh, Ra is just acknowledging that you, you had it spot on. Um, thank you. I need to answer my phone because I'm in isolation. I'm probably being summoned for a test. Hang on a second. <laughs> so <laughs> while Rod goes and sorts out his um, quarantine, could we go to nature, which was uh, the group three? Nature and regeneration. That was uh, my group. That was all our fellows. Basically, every cohort was there, which was quite cool. Um, and Tabiso or Veronica, Peter, anyone wants to share a bit of what we discussed? I'm happy to try and summarize. Um, the conversation started uh, with uh, Eric and Emmeline and I. We talked about measuring different, uh, different things from satellite, uh, biodiversity, sedimentation, carbon um, and then uh, we talked about you know once you can do this you can start making the polluters pay and say you know people in the public might be able to be like well why is the Waimakariri River dirty today while well, so-and-so is harvesting their trees or or whatever and then um, uh, to be so pointed out that maybe uh, legal enforcement may, isn't you know maybe we should think about pulling people rather than pushing them and then we had a conversation about how um, legal mandates people tend to accept if everyone knows it's an emergency. If they don't see it as an emergency, there might be a lot of pushback. So um, that was really interesting. We talked a lot about that. Um, and then um, I can't quite remember how we finished. Paula, if you want to jump back in, but that's that's about what I remember off the top of my head. Then was Tavisa talking about the culture point on Tavisa? Yeah, you wanna... just to... yeah. Yeah, just to add on, I, mean, I think Peter and you captured it well, but essentially we had this generative conversation around, okay, there's the need to deter or, you know, instill that sense of fear with the legal structures, but sometimes there could be maybe a need to balance, uh, but more so skewing towards building it in as a culture where people mm. can actually really live it, just like how when they wake up, they brush their teeth. Uh, it's natural for them to live in cohabitation with the environment in a way in which they don't harm it because they know it will feed them and keeping it safe and the diversity, you know, working that way can actually reduce all the climate change fears that we have and all the government mm. urgencies to try and mitigate. But, mm. you know, I, we had a great legal expert in our room as well, which was fascinating. Uh, who then mentioned, yeah, I do know, but sometimes to get to quick uh, or to get decisions made quickly or to get behavior changing quickly, we do need to enforce mm -hmm. laws. But I think Paula summarized it all by giving us an example of uh, Argentina, you know, with regards to how they legalized uh, same-sex marriage and it became tradition and became part of the culture. Uh, mm -hmm. Not quite a harmful thing, <laughs> Uh, but with nature, sometimes it could be because it has also psychosocial elements that come with those deterrents. But it was a great conversation overall, and I hope to continue it with yeah, many others that were in that room. Thank you so much. So thank you. Uh, and then we'll go to the group that I was a part of. Um, 
Would anyone in the team like to perhaps give a summary? I wonder, Alina, you had some great points that you raised. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, uh, we talked a little bit about the role of story and narrative, which as most of you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm all about um, in, in creating the culture change that's necessary to bring people with us, because there has been a lot of focus in the last um, session on policies, um, tools, um, processes, uh, but less so on the actual um, mindset shift that's required to bring the voting public with us to support those policies um, and so on. Yeah. Do we, um, yeah, sorry, Rosalie. No, that's, that's, um, there was also, um, what we also talked about was the, the tracking and the mapping of biodiversity, because there are some initiatives that Nathaniel and also Deborah were able to talk to. Um, but also recognizing, and again, it came back to communications, which is that some of these are being done within a scientific environment. And what we're not seeing is that shift from publishing in a, in a science journal through into actually creating and telling the story of what the possibility and, and the impact of that can be. And then James um, was really powerful on um, oceans and I guess the disappointment of deferring oceans policy, given that ocean warming is actually really at the heart of climate change. Um, James, you spoke, is, it, would, is there anything that you'd like to add or just share back to the team? Uh, well, I suppose it's not all negative. I mean, there's a lot of people doing great work and I think we should just celebrate that. If you go to any place in Aotearoa, you'll be, I think, less than 170 kilometers from the sea. So we are we are an island nation. So we have the you know sea yeah the Crown Research Institute doing great work, the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. We have uh, Cawthron Institute. We have lots of you know nonprofits, community groups from the tip of Cape Rango all the way down the bluff. We have sustainable uh, fisheries organizations from the Chatham Islands. Um, to you know the Hawks Bay and Bay of Plenty and and Coromando and I think we should really celebrate that we have immense Taonga species. Um, I'm thinking of the Maui dolphin. I'm thinking of um, penguins, uh, six species of penguins, the seabirds. We've got an incredible seaweed sector that needs boosting. Um, it's just the fragmentation of the policy. For, um, yeah, landscape here is so fragmented that um, we we are just facing a very slow reform process and that needs to be accelerated so we can allow these industries to really uh, boom and I think there's a three to 15 billion increase that's projected by I think it was the Cawthron Institute and uh, through a sustainable seas uh, national science challenge project a few years back a report was published on the blue economy and there's a real opportunity I think we should really consider that we instead of farming land instead of cows we need to have fish more fish and so think of that associated with protection, marine protected areas, 30%, 40% or more. And then we'll have a, a booming um, ocean sector, sustainable ocean sector, which is what the blue economy is in line with the SDG 14. Uh, and my son agrees, clearly. <laughs> um, so that's what I wanted to say, yeah. Yeah. Listen, thank you. And look, I want to thank everybody for, for your time and just staying with us for, for, the, for the conversation and the chance just to let some of these ideas and things breathe. What I'd like to do is just hand back to Rod to give a summary of what we've heard today, because Rod, your voice has been so powerful and also you have your own reflections on COP. So I'll hand back to you and then I'll, um, I'll finish with the karakia. Oh, well, thank you, Rosalie. And, uh, and thank you to all for being uh, uh, very active participants in the conversation today. We're at such an amazing moment um, where there is at last some clarity around the world about what the sort of fundamental goal is, uh, as Johan identified. Um, and just this extraordinary acceleration um, of our activity and in invention and creation going on. And yet, um, to some extent, uh, we're still in this lull here in New Zealand 
um, waiting for the government to come up with its emissions reductions plan, now put off from the end of this year into May of next year. But it was very encouraging to hear from Vicky uh, about um, some of the elements that are going into that. But, um, but what's developing is this amazing opportunity for us um, in all our diversity of EHF um, fellows um, and our particular passions and skills um, to be able to, uh, I think, play a really, really important role in trying to um, encourage and build up and, and establish relationships um, across the country that we can um, really get some momentum going uh, uh, from a civil society and business NGO academic point of view and all the rest to then offer a really big hand to government so the government then delivers um, the sort of um, policies and programs we need and uh, clearly um, the civil service is really stretched on this uh, in terms of capability to be able to develop all this. So um, I'm hoping that this is going to be a fairly open door um, from government, um, that um, the uh, civil society will be bringing ideas that they will then, the government will then help us operationalize. And um, so a very great moment um, uh, in time. But then crucially for us from an EHF point of view, and we've deliberately made this second part, the second part of the conversation is, of course, how we organize ourselves around this, um, um, where we will start coalescing around um, particular topics uh, with particular fellows and, and what support um, the fellowship can give and we to each other and to be able to take that work forward. So that's going to be very much the next part of the conversation. But I've, I very much hope um, this morning um, uh, has, um, you know, given you a sort of that sense of excitement about um, the enormous potential for us and, of course, the enormous need. Uh, always a huge treat to have Johan with us um, and Vicky too. Um, so um, this is, uh, I'm speaking personally, I, I'm just I'm thrilled to that we as a small country um, are a diverse country, but we're actually closely connected. And um, it's small democracies that are much bigger, better off than big ones. So, you know, eight of the top 10 democracies measured by the EIU, they're all countries with 10 million people or less. And so, we, we, and we've got this huge tongue of um, our great um, natural environment and then and our natural capital. And then most important of all, to our Māori, that um, mm. really deep knowledge um, and worldview about how we humans are just part of that extraordinary web of life. And so we have real responsibility to that. It gives us life. We are responsible for um, how we nurture life in that, in that web. I find it amazingly exciting how um, Ta'al Māori um, is, is a, a more and more people are drawn to it. So I think in, in all of those elements come together for us um, here in Aotearoa um, over the next few years. Um, it's going to be an amazing period of transformation. And um, I know that we in the fellowship can um, really play mm -hmm. our part in that. Rod, thank you so much. And just to give a really personal thanks from everybody here for bringing your wisdom, your insight, always beautiful humility and passion and also gritty optimism um, in what is actually often a very complex and difficult sector. So thank you uh, so much, particularly when you're in quarantine and probably feeling a bit jet lagged, particularly after the incredible week of intensity that you had at COP. So uh, look, we will wind up now. I just want to remind you um, about two further upcoming sessions today. Uh, one is on the potential of climate education. And this is really because when we're talking about systems change, that we have to shift mindsets and behaviors. And so this is not just education at a school level or even tertiary, but how do we educate professionals and executives and those in positions of leadership to drive change? There is um, a, an active team of fellows 
who are looking at this and bringing an international program, looking at how we can bring it together, integrate te ao Māori and, and then uh, educate in such a way that it's very specific to Aotearoa. So um, anyone interested in that area, I'd really encourage that you join that. Then we also have a session we heard from Peter earlier on the 2035 Oceana Summit, which will be held in April 22. Now that's going to be a large regional gathering of leaders and innovators, uh, New Zealand, Australasia, and I think it also goes to Asia Pacific, working across sectors and climate response. And there's a, there's a real invitation here to how do we help to be engage and help to shape this? Um, so look, thank you all for joining us today. There will be a summary published and this uh, is not the end of the conversation. It's actually the beginning of the conversation for us. So I'd just like to um, close this session uh, with a karakia um, and release you all to your day. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapune. Kia wātea, kia mama, te nāko, te tinana, te wairua, e te ara, te takata. Thank you all.